Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is The Norman Invasion, Part 1, 1156 to 1166. This show is the first in a multi-part series looking at one of the great epic stories from Irish history, the Norman Conquest of the 12th century. This invasion, which changed Ireland forever, is set to a backdrop of war, turmoil and destruction on a level unseen in Ireland prior to these events. It's a fascinating tale, laced with battles and sieges, while the key players, Rory O'Connor, Diarmid Machmara, Strongbow and Henry II, to name but a few, are larger-than-life characters who are willing to do almost anything to advance their interests, which makes for a great narrative. This episode begins then what is an odyssey through medieval Irish history, starting in 1156 amid a ferocious interdynastic dispute between the O'Connors of Connacht and the McLaughlins of Ulster, the consequences of which no one could have foreseen. When the great king, Thurlock O'Connor, died in 1156, his son Rory was inaugurated as King of the O'Connors, the ruling dynasty of Connacht, making him one of the most powerful men on the island of Ireland. Being Thurlock's son, this left Rory a lot to live up to. But in 1156, the passing of his father surely must have created a maelstrom of emotions for Rory. While Thurlock had been a great king, indeed the greatest in the O'Connor's family history, he had also had a difficult relationship with his sons. Twenty years earlier, in 1136, Rory had joined some of his older brothers in an attempt to depose their father. In this, Rory learned a stark lesson in power and the ruthlessness needed to maintain it. Thurlock had not only quashed his son's rebellion, but he imprisoned Rory, who spent the following years in captivity. Rory's older brother, A, was not so lucky. Presumably, the ringleader, he was blinded by Thurlock for his part. Rory never forgot the lesson he was taught in this debacle, and within weeks of his own inauguration, he replicated it. Showing himself every bit his father's son, he didn't wait for his brothers to attack him, but preemptively struck at them capturing three, imprisoning them and even blinding one of them. While this may have been trying times in the O'Connor household, it unquestionably helped Rory solidify his position in Connacht. Security at home was something he needed, however. Tough times lay ahead for Rory. His father Turlock O'Connor's memory would be something he would be measured by and it was a high standard to meet. During his momentous 50-year reign, Thurlock had transformed the Kingdom of Connacht in the west of Ireland from a backwater in medieval politics to the preeminent power of early 12th century Ireland. Now this was no mean feat. Being based in Connacht, Thurlock had been bridled with some severe disadvantages. Situated in the west of Ireland, Connacht was the most isolated kingdom on the island. To make matters worse, much of the province was covered in bogs, mountains and lakes and there were no major towns to speak of. Yes, despite these disadvantages, Thurlock had pushed Connacht centre stage. For Rory in 1156, this was a lot to live up to, particularly given the circumstances he found himself in. While his father had crushed many of their opponents, he had failed to stop the rise of a man Rory had very good reason to fear when he came to power in 1156. This was Murkertoch MacLachlan, the King of Western Ulster and a key player in mid-12th century Irish politics. When Rory was inaugurated as King, there was one man in particular he must have been really nervous about. Murkertoch MacLachlan. He could not deal with him in the same easy manner he had swept aside his brothers. But if he wanted to emulate his father's great achievements and dominate Ireland, 
he needed to overcome Murkertach. McLaughlin, in spite of his surname, was king of what was the wider Northern O'Neill kingdom. His family had branched off the wider O'Neill clan after taking the name of a certain Lachlan O'Neill in the late 10th century, hence the name Mach or son of Lachlan. Murkertach was a formidable opponent and had studied the arts of war in a similar school to Rory, his own internal family disputes. The O'Neill kingdom was sharply divided between Murkertach's family, the McLaughlins, on the one side and the branch of the family that still held the ancestral name of O'Neill on the other. And this led to almost constant, violent and bloody feuds. When Murkertach was only a boy, his father Niall had been killed in one such feud in 1119. Then his uncle Connor, the reigning king, was assassinated in 1136 amid similar circumstances. When Murkertach followed Connor as king in that year of 1136, it would take him another nine years before he had butchered and cleaved his way through his relatives to solidify his position as king of Ulster. Eventually, in 1145, he was in a position where he could begin to expand his power and this brought him into conflict with Rory's ageing father, Thurloch. By the early 1150s, Murkertach had successfully pushed Thurloch aside, becoming the most powerful king in Ireland, with a series of victories, one of which Rory O'Connor would never forget. In 1153, while commanding a force of his father's troops, Rory had been ambushed and thoroughly routed by Murkertach. Among the large numbers killed were two of his own nephews. One can only imagine how such an event must have haunted Rory in the years afterwards. In 1156, with Murkertach as Ireland's most powerful king and Rory the aspirational son of one of the 12th century's most successful kings, it was obvious it was only a matter of time before these two came into conflict. Indeed, the coming conflict was highly predictable and it was increasingly obvious where it would take place. By the mid-12th century, one of Ireland's oldest and at one time most powerful kingdoms, Meath, was in a state of collapse and its territories were becoming the key battleground for dominance in Ireland. As the star of the Kingdom of Connacht and the O'Connors rose through the early 12th century, the sun set on what had at one time been the greatest power in Ireland, the great southern O'Neill kingdom of Meath. Meath lay to the north of Dublin, in the modern counties of Meath and West Meath. It was a highly fertile land, centred on the Boyne and Shannon valleys, with a history stretching back millennia, even in the 12th century. Before the pharaohs of Egypt built their pyramids, societies in the Boyne Valley of Meath built the remarkable structure of Newgrange, a massive construction aligned with the rising sun on the winter solstice. Between the 8th and 10th centuries, the kings of Mead had gone on to dominate Ireland. It was a rich and wealthy territory during this period, which could be seen in the numerous monasteries which its kings patronised. However, these monasteries, a symbol of Mead's wealth, were its undoing. They soaked up wealth and added little to the kingdom materially. Essentially, too much of the kingdom's resources were invested in religion and while it could offer salvation, it wasn't of much use on the battlefield or in terms of generating revenue. Where this weakened the kingdom, its rivals in the hyper-competitive world of medieval Ireland began to eye up this rich and strategically important territory. By the time Rory O'Connor was born around 1120, it was a spent force, as the major surrounding powers sought to control it by imposing their candidates to rule the region in their strategic interests. By the mid-1150s, Meath had become the focus of conflict between the O'Connors and the rising power of Murkertach MacLachlan in Ulster. In 1156, it was obvious it would be here where Rory would have to fight Murkertach and, if the previous years of conflict were anything to go by, it didn't look good for Rory. It had been Murkertach who had been the more dynamic, particularly when tensions arose when the reigning King of Mead 
died in highly suspect circumstances in 1155. His death launched a scramble where the surrounding powers sought to install candidates of their choosing. In such a situation, speed and rapidity were key to success. But before the O'Connors even got out of the blocks, Murkertuk had arrived south into Mead with an army and imposed his candidate, Dunica, from the Royal House of Mead. While this was only a temporary solution for Murkertuk, as the civil war soon exploded in Mead, it didn't bode well for Rory. He and his father had been caught completely flat-footed. Worse still, Murkertuk continued to show the dynamism he had illustrated in this campaign in the early months of Rory's reign. Rory's hopes of emulating his father's great successes appeared to be diminishing by the week. While Rory managed to take power relatively peacefully, the death of his father Turlock must nonetheless have caused a certain degree of turmoil in Connacht. There were few alive who could even remember a time before Turlock was king, given he had ruled for an incredible 50 years, longer than most people lived in this period. So it was that as Connacht and its new king Rory adjusted to this new situation, Murkertuk MacLachlan was able to bolster his position even further. He did this by depriving Rory of any potential allies, by making treaties and installing kings that were friendly to him rather than Rory, and thereby he established himself as unquestionably the most powerful king in Ireland. Now this process led to a fateful meeting that would have dramatic consequences for Ireland when Murkertuk travelled to the Kingdom of Leinster and made a pact with the reigning king there, Dermot MacMurrah. This would prove to be one of the most fateful alliances in medieval Irish history. While Dermot MacMurrah may not have been a central figure in the power struggle in Ireland in the early 1150s, in the following decades he would become one of the most important players. When McLaughlin met MacMurrah, he cut an impressive figure. According to 12th century sources, he was tall and well built, a brave and warlike man whose voice was hoarse as a result of constantly being in the din of battle. However, it was his personality that made him what can only be described as somewhat of a terrifying figure. If anything, he comes across as a tyrant in the sources that record his deeds and actions. Rising to power in Leinster around 1132, the early Gaelic references of him paint a character with a penchant for cruelty. In his earliest noted act, dating from around 1132, he raided a nunnery in Kildare. The abbess Moore was raped, or as the annals of Loch Key circumspectly state, she was carried off a prisoner and put in a man's bed. In 1141, he continued on this vein when he blinded or killed 17 of his rivals in Leinster, an act that shocked even this age that glorified violence. After his death, a Norman chronicler recalled that Dermot oppressed his nobles and raged against the chief men in his kingdom, with a tyranny grievous and impossible to bear. He was inimical towards his own people and hated by others. All men's hands were against him and he was hostile to all men. When Murkertuk MacLachlan met him in 1156, he no doubt cared little what Dermot did to nuns, his own people or his rivals. Murkertuk needed an ally and this man was perfect. He was strategically perfectly located in Ireland. Dermot in Leinster was to the south of that crucial territory of Mead and had long-term ambitions to expand there. An alliance between Dermot and Murkertuk to the north of Mead in Ulster put this crucial kingdom in a vice-like situation. In 1156, few could have known it, but now the entire history of Ireland lay in the future of these two men and a series of somewhat rash and reckless decisions they made. These decisions were, however, a long way off, and in the short term, dominating Mead was a crucial objective. So, after the meeting, MacMurrah, presumably with Murkertuk's consent, added fuel to the flames of the war-torn kingdom when he intervened in an ongoing civil war there. He supported a candidate, Dunica, who had already been supported by Murkertuk. 
Therefore, as 11.56 drew to a close, Mwakatuk McLaughlin now had allies in Leinster and Mead. For Rory O'Connor in Connacht, this was deeply troubling. He was being boxed in and Mwakatuk's alliance with McMurray did not bode well for the future, or rather, his future at least. In early 1157, things went from bad to worse for Rory. McLaughlin, now with momentum, expanded his power even further. His campaign that year took him through what must have been now the wasted kingdom of Meath, given all the recent warfare. He then joined Dermot MacMurra, and together they swept into Munster and divided the province between candidates of Murkertuck's choosing. For Rory O'Connor, this was disastrous. And as the summer of 1157 progressed, he can only have been getting extremely nervous. When Murkertuck took submission and reorganised the province of Munster, Rory now faced the scary vista of being surrounded on all sides by hostile forces. He had to act. While McLaughlin was still on campaign, Rory led a force and slipped across the border into Ulster and raided Murkertuck's home territory. It was a clever ploy. Murkertuck naturally had to return north to defend his home territory, which left Rory free to attack Munster and reinstall his supporters there, giving him breathing space. But clever and all as this was, it displayed a core weakness. Rory had avoided direct conflict with Murkertuck. This situation, though, couldn't last long. A major conflict between O'Connor and the King in Ulster was on the horizon, and it was McLaughlin who seemed the far stronger of the two. Luckily for Rory O'Connor, in 1158, Murkertuck couldn't attack him because he was distracted by what was the constant thorn in his side, internal problems in Ulster. That year, his vassals, the Macalevies and O'Carls, revolted. Murkertuck couldn't ignore this threat so close to home, but by the end of the year, he had re-established his dominance in the province and in 1159, he was on the march again. His initial attacks that year saw him bring an army into Meath, which had by this point descended into utter chaos. While he managed to install a candidate of his choosing yet again, this was only a stopgap measure at best. King's reigns in Meath could be measured in terms of months at this point. Indeed, the only hope for Meath was that Murkertuch or Rory would emerge utterly dominant and they would be able to impose their will on the region. As 1159 progressed, there was some solace for the people of Meath when it appeared that a major showdown between the two was imminent, as in the West, Rory O'Connor was making preparations for war. In the late 1150s, Rory O'Connor could not have fancied his chances against Murkertuch and his ally, McMurray. He needed allies, and this left him in an absolutely unenviable situation. In 1159, he found himself with little option but to negotiate with the last man in Ireland anyone would want to have to rely on, Tiernan O'Rourke, the King of Breffney. Breffney was technically part of Connacht. Known as the Rough Third, it was a country of hilly uplands and lakes, with neighbours few could have envied. To his north, Tiernan faced the might of the O'Neills, while to his south lay the territories of the O'Connors. However, despite the natural and political problems they faced, the O'Rourke kings of Breffney had grown in power in the late 11th century, as Mead, which was situated to their southwest, began to collapse, which allowed them to expand. By the 1150s, they were in effect an independent power. When Rory met Tiernan, he was a very distinctive character. An older man by perhaps 20 years, he bore the marks of a hard and violent life. He had only one eye. However, it wasn't his physical appearance that would have made Rory dubious about forming an alliance with him. It was his personality. Tiernan was perhaps the most duplicitous, untrustworthy character in Ireland in the 12th century, and that's saying a lot. He had been allied to Turlough, Rory's father, on numerous occasions, but each time had double-crossed him. 
Perhaps by 1159, though, Tiernan was slightly more loyal. Murkatuk McLaughlin's alliance with Dermot MacMurrah had been really bad news for Tiernan. MacMurrah, like Tiernan, had sought to expand into Meath and they had clashed in the province on several occasions. However, this was only one part of the hatred that burned between these two men. In 1152, MacMurrah had either eloped or possibly abducted O'Rourke's wife, Dervla. The details of the events are shrouded in mystery, but Dervla certainly spent the best part of a year with MacMurrah before returning to O'Rourke. The fallout, as you might expect, was immense, and this event made the two men bitter and implacable enemies. This enmity pushed O'Rourke into Rory's hands, as he no doubt hoped that in this alliance he would be able to gain retribution over MacMurrah. Even with reservations, Rory had little option but to form the alliance with Tiernan, and now Ireland was firmly divided between two camps whose political rivalries were fuelled by deep personal hatreds. The outcome of this inevitable conflict would be lethal, but no one had any idea just how lethal. In later 1159, Rory and Tiernan went on the attack. No doubt O'Connor was keen for O'Rourke to commit to his cause, indeed as well as word. A pact bound in blood was more likely to last. So it was that later in the summer of 1159, they began to build a bridge across the Shannon between Connacht and Mead. In an indication of what was to come, ferocious fighting now took place around the bridge as Murkatuk McLaughlin's ally, the king he had installed in Mead, tried desperately to burn the bridge before it could be completed. While it would cost them dearly, including the life of Rory O'Connor's son, the bridge was successfully completed and an amassed army now pushed its way into Mead. The goal, however, was not the rearrangement of Mead. That could wait. Instead, Rory led his army into eastern Ulster. This was the weak underbelly of Murkertuck McLaughlin's territory, the realm of the McAlevies and O'Carrolls, whose loyalty to the king in western Ulster had always wavered. However, while they were not keen on being dominated by Murkertuck, the northern kings found what little unity they could muster when attacked from the outside. At R.D., Rory O'Connor, supported by Tiernan O'Rourke amongst others, met the joint armies of the north, led by Murkertuck McLaughlin. The outcome was decisive, bloody and costly. Rory and his allies were smashed in a resounding victory for Murkertuck. As the Connacht men now fell back in disarray, McLaughlin pushed home his advantage. He swept into Mead and began a complete reorganisation. Tiernan O'Rourke was stripped of all lands he had taken there in previous years. Then the Northern Army crossed the Shannon into Connacht and devastated the region, but ultimately failed to track Rory down. However, there was no denying the outcome of this conflict. O'Connor had been hammered. Perhaps the only consolation in this defeat was that O'Rourke had no choice but to lie in the bed he had made with Rory. His fate was inextricably linked to the restoration of O'Connor power. By early 1160, Murkatuk McLaughlin now seemed utterly dominant and O'Connor defeated. But an internal feud prevented Murkatuk pushing home this advantage. Despite their great victory at RD the previous year, Murkatuk's internal rivals for power in Ulster never really accepted his rule and in 1160 the North sank into another round of assassinations and revenge killings. This spate saw pledges broken and deceit and treachery reign. Deeper hatred was sown between the major families of Murkatuk's kingdom. While his power was never ultimately in question, this turmoil certainly weakened him nonetheless and it gave Rory O'Connor a chance to reassert himself. It was the unfortunate people of Meath who would pay the price of this reassertion when Rory raided across the Shannon. No doubt that it was at the urging of his one-eyed ally O'Rourke that he even pushed into North Leinster and took some territory from McLaughlin's ally, the man who had eloped with O'Rourke's wife, Dermot MacMurrah. This appears to have been enough to force Murkatuk 
who had to increasingly look over his shoulder at the incessant feuding within his own family to seek something of a temporary solution to his conflict with Rory. Therefore, in 1161, he made an agreement whereby Meath was divided between Rory in the west and a minor king in the east. This was not by any means a permanent solution. Huge underlying tension remained. And Rory O'Connor was young. And while he may have suffered a major defeat in 1159, he could bide his time. Once an opportunity arose to strike at McLaughlin, he wouldn't hesitate. His ambition was also urged on by his ally O'Rourke, whose hatred of McLaughlin's ally, McMurra, was insatiable. Despite the foundations of sand on which this piece was built, it still held together during the following years and there was little conflict between the major powers. That was until the mid-1160s, when war erupted in what was a pretty spectacular and unforeseen manner. No doubt everyone expected that the peace of 1161 would ultimately fail over some crisis in Meath, that volatile region that had been dragging the major powers of Ireland into wars for decades. Indeed, Tiernan O'Rourke had been launching raids into the territory. However, this didn't provoke war. Instead it came when Murkutuk McLaughlin made an incredibly foolish, almost inexplicable move that gifted Rory O'Connor what was the chance of a lifetime. The first inkling of major problems arose in 1164 among Murkertuck McLaughlin's own family of all places. As we have seen, ever since he had come to power, he had been plagued by internal rivalries. Since his inauguration in 1136, he had been fighting on and off against his O'Neill cousins, who had refused to accept him as king. And in 1164, these tensions came to the fore yet again. While Murkertuck was able to contain the O'Neills on this occasion, the instability provoked wider dissension across Ulster. In the following year, 1165, he faced much wider problems when one of his main vassals, Okig Makalevi, rose against him. Murkertuck went to war and easily defeated the Makalevis and had the king, Okig, imprisoned. No doubt feeling he had made his point, Murkertuck was happy to have him eventually restored to power but not without serious conditions. To guarantee Okig Makalevi's loyalty, sons were taken from all the major families in eastern Ulster as hostages. Very importantly, given what happened next, swore to abide by the agreement they made before the Archbishop of Armagh and another king in Ulster, Donacha O'Carroll. This should have ended the matter. However, in 1166, Mwakatok made a catastrophic and fatal error of judgment that would make you think he may actually have been losing his mind. Despite having sworn a holy oath before the Archbishop of Armagh, he went ahead and captured Macalevy for no apparent reason and blinded him, while also executing three prominent nobles from the kingdom. If medieval Gaelic society was anything, it was highly conservative, and the breaking of convention like this outraged the North, and in particular, Donnacha O'Carroll, in whose presence the oath had been sworn. The seriousness of this is hard to overstate. In a modern context, I guess it's something similar to acting in contempt of the Supreme Court, but the punishment was far more serious. Many of those who had sworn oaths of loyalty to Murkertuk now relinquished them and began to distance themselves from the man who had broken his own oath. His power began to melt away before him, this now triggered a chain of events that would have immense consequences. In Connacht, once Rory O'Connor heard what was afoot, he knew his hour had come. Murkertuck's power was weak and fading, and Rory had a chance to step into his shoes. Adding another dimension to this chain of events, Rory's ally, Tiernan O'Rourke, was no doubt not really thinking about McLaughlin, but instead his ally, McMurra, who 14 years earlier had eloped or abducted his wife. If McLaughlin fell, McMurray would be isolated and vulnerable. They say revenge is a dish best served cold. In 1166, Tiernan O'Rourke was about to find out. 
As Murakatuk McLaughlin's power ebbed away, Rory O'Connor immediately crossed the Shannon and soon allies began to flock to his standard. He was joined by Tiernan O'Rourke of Breffney, who was no doubt baying for blood at this stage. They first marched on Dublin, where they easily won over the inhabitants of the city who had previously submitted to McMurrah. The world of medieval Ireland was changing and changing really fast. Alliances with McLaughlin and McMurrah were increasingly toxic. This was clearly illustrated when Rory next received the support of Dunica O'Carroll, one of the kings of Eastern Ulster. Murkatuk McLaughlin was living on borrowed time. Rory, no doubt, at O'Rourke's urging, first, however, turned on the last possible friend McLaughlin had, the King of Leinster, Dermot MacMurrah. O'Connor and O'Rourke swept south through Leinster and routed MacMurrah, thoroughly defeating him. Happy that he had now been removed as a contender, they turned north to deliver the coup de grace to McLaughlin, whose power in Ulster was diminishing by the day. In the end, Rory O'Connor played very little role in McLaughlin's downfall. Donegal O'Carroll, that king, in whose presence Murkatuk had sworn an oath, led the attack, unsurprisingly aided by Murkatuk's O'Neill cousins and rivals. For Murkatuk, the man who had dominated Ireland for over a decade, the end came in rather ignominious circumstances, when he was killed in a minor, relatively obscure skirmish, having been abandoned by most of his supporters. With Murkatuk dead, as the end of the year 1166 approached, Rory O'Connor seemed to be in what was a relatively unassailable position. The only potential threat was Dermot MacMurrah, who, while he had been severely weakened by Rory's invasion earlier in the year, was still clinging to power in the face of major internal revolt. Tiernan O'Rourke, however, would not allow his nemesis survive in a post murkatuk McLaughlin world, and O'Connor had no reason to protect him either. Destroying MacMurrah as a threat seemed like the astute move. Allowing him to survive, even if severely weakened, was only dangerous. Before the end of the year came, O'Rourke was let off the leash by the all-powerful O'Connor and he swept into Leinster for the second time. O'Rourke destroyed MacMurrah's stronghold at Ferns in the modern county Wexford and then deposed him and banished him from Ireland. All hope seemed to have evaporated for Dermot MacMurrah Indeed, he was even abandoned by his own family. Two of his brothers were installed as kings in his place as the Kingdom of Leinster was partitioned into two weak and ineffectual kingdoms. 1166 had proven to be an incredible year. McLaughlin and MacMurrah, who had been the major power in Ireland for years, were either dead or exiled, effectively wiped off the map. When word reached Rory O'Connor that O'Rourke had banished MacMurrah overseas, He may well have thought this was the last he would ever hear from him. However, alone and seemingly desperate, Dermot McMurrah may have been down, but he wasn't out. When he was exiled from Ireland, he still had friends in high places, indeed very high places. And when forced out of Ireland in 1166, he set off to find the most powerful of them. A man who was the Count of Anjou, the Duke of Aquitaine, the Duke of Normandy, and last but not least, King of England. This man was Henry II. If MacMurrah could convince Henry to help him, Rory O'Connor would face the fight of a lifetime. Tune in next time to hear how Diarmuid MacMurrah fared overseas while Rory O'Connor solidifies his position in Ireland. Don't forget if you want to book a place on the tour of medieval Dublin on Saturday, June 14th, contact me at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. That's history at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time, slán. <laughs>